really want to, you know, op- really thankful that Walter has has persevered in getting this going. This is actually the fourth international electrostatics meeting. We, uh, Antonio did one in, in Portugal, and then um, we had kind of, which was a ce- celebration of, of Walter Knopf by a lot of his students that it was really quite lovely. I mean, it was, that wasn't the, how we called it, but that was kind of how it ended up being. And then Anna, and I've forgotten who worked with you. We had a wonderful meeting in in, in uh, Belgrade, and so and we were planning on doing this in 2020. So it's really great. I also want to thank Walter because during the pandemic, the online um, electrostatics meeting was by far the best and you know, not, you know, virtual meeting that I attended. The amount of, of discussion at that meeting was really remarkable. And I, I don't quite know exactly how, you know, how he did it, but he really made it work. So I want to thank him for that. So today I want to talk about um, protonation microstates, which is something new to in our lab. And um, so basically, we'll see how far I get, but we're going to, what I'm going to talk about is what we can get out of Monte Carlo. In general, we've used Monte Carlo to get averages of properties we want to get the Boltzmann distri- distributed average. So protonation states, ask who large life is, um, co- you know, hydrogen bond networks, um, but but the fact is the Monte Carlo ensemble should be the Boltzmann ensemble. And if we can save the ensemble, which might be tens of millions of states, we can then mine that ensemble to get new information that we don't get when we just look at averages. So um, to remind you, um, let's see, is this going to... All right, wants to do that. All right, to remind you how MCCE works, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it basically is a, uh, it basically takes acidic residues, uh, bases, basic residues, uh, can do redox states, and it will, um, it will also look at the side chain positions. So here you can see there are many uh, possible side chain positions, um, histautomers, and it will also look at small angle, small molecule binding. So basically, waters can come and go out back into solution, chloride or other small ions. And so all of these degrees of freedom are are basically um, brought to equilibrium in the same Monte Carlo sampling. So we use Delphi plus on Boltzmann, and I'm I'm actually becoming more, you know, of a, a you know, really thinking that continuum electrostatics is uh, has been underrated and is actually a very useful tool, and I'm happy to, you know, talk to people about that. We get from that the pairwise electrostatics between any two groups if they are regard whether they're charged or polar. We get the desalvation penalties because the residues are moving around. We need a molecular mechanics force field. And again, one of the limitations of MCCE is that it has a rigid backbone. So we're basically going to do this, and we can get, as I said, changing the chemical potential of an electron or a proton. We get EMs and PKs. And then we, during the equilibration phase, if we run this with explicit water, we'll see where all the waters are and where are the hydrogen bonds between waters and amino acids and waters and each other. So this would be my my dream. We're not quite there yet, but if we run MCCE, we what I'm going to show you today is how we get protonation microstates, and this will give us show us where the protons can be loaded and unloaded when we do proton pumping. We can also in MCCE see when hydrogen bonds are being made in the plethora of Monte Carlo states. So we see yes, a hydrogen bond can be made. Now, the thing that I'm going to try, one of the, the things I will tell you is that we do get these protonation microstates, and I would really like to encourage you to think about these as something that can go into molecular dynamics. Um, 
We've used molecular dynamics trajectories also to get hydrogen bonds. And we can take multiple snapshots and bring them back into MCCE to look at P how PKs and EMs and other properties change in, in the trajectory. So this would be the virtual cycle. It's not, it, it, you, one can do it. It's not as easy as I would like it to be. So the question I want to start with is, how many micro? How you know? How, how many protonation states is a protein in? You know, is there is we is there a single protonation state? You think okay, S blue large lice are ionized. Uh, his, I'm not sure. Tyrosines and cysteine are neutral. So you, most people, I think, might say, oh, other than the his, histidines, I'm, I think that sure, one microstate. But that's not been our experience. So again, I just want to point out what am I talking about when I talk about these protonation microstates? Here, if I say I have one, two, three groups, they can be all neutral. Any one of them can be ionized. Any two of them can be ionized and any three of them can be ionized. So each one of these columns is a different protonation microstate for this system of three residues. And in MCCE, each one of this protonation microstate will be combined with many, many conformation states that have that protonation state. Okay, so here's lysozyme, a nice test case. Uh, we get the PKs of this pretty, pretty well. So we can say, what is, so this is the range of, of energies in the accepted microstates in MCCE. So I was quite amazed at how broad this is. And we basically see, as one would hope in a Boltzmann distribution, a wide range of energies. Now, this is a, a picture I'm going to show you again and again. So these are, each one of these dots is a protonation microstate. So it, it has the protons in a specific location on every amino acid. Um, so here's a protonation microstate where the lysozyme has a charge of 11. Here's another one where it has a charge of 10. Here's another one where it has a charge of 12. Okay. So now if I go down this, this column, these are all tautomers. Okay. So they all have the same net charge, but the protons are in different places. So at pH five or four, I think, the, there are 222 protonation microstates for a simple thing like lysozyme. Now at pH seven, in fact, where most things are, are much more you know, fully ionized, um, we only get 24 microstates, okay? So that's, so even a small protein like lysozyme has more, well more than one. And I, I guess I also want, want to say that here you see that, you know, this is, this is a log scale for the occupancy in the Boltzmann distribution. So you mostly want to look at the top. Okay, so there's like four, maybe, you know, six microstates that would be fairly highly populated. These guys might show up 10 times in the in 25 million uh, Boltzmann in our, you know, in our ensemble. So, so this is now a protein which whose day job is working with charges and protons. I'm not going to tell you much about it, but it's a, it's a, a photosynthetic protein. And basically, there's a region here which is near a site where protons are going to be bound in when an electron gets onto the site. So here we have 132 acids and bases. And we find that, that of the 26 aspartic acids, 15 of them are in different protonation states. And most of those 15 that are changing protonation state are in this box. And seven of these um, aspartic acids that are in this box that are changing protonation states are on the proton transfer path. So we can go through and look at for each of them, and we see 45 residues are in different protonation states, and we see about six, 60,000 different protonation states. So, you know, again, and here you need over 600 protonation states to get 90% of the ensemble. So there's a wide range of um, protonation states that are going to be happening up here. So you, if you look up here, I hope you can see. Yeah. So if you look at these ones up here, there's like 600 that you need to sum up to get 90%. Which now, okay. So why am I doing this? Am I doing this just to scare you and say, oh, there's lots of protonation states? You know, it's you can't just 
put one in your in your your analysis. Well, you get all kinds of new information. So one thing we can do is we can look at the the um, the correlation between pairs of residues. So along the diagonal is I am 100% correlated with myself. And, and basically here, I would see that this um, glutamic acid 43 is negatively correlated. It's brown with glutamic acid 79. So when when 43 is in microstates where 43 is negatively charged, 79 is less likely to be negatively charged. So having all of the protonation states, I can find this out. So let's look at something where we, we just look at the really hot parts. And what we can see here is if I put an electron on the quinone, what I see is that I'm highly negatively correlated. When, when the quinone becomes negative, these two glutamic acids become less negative. Well, that makes sense, okay? But when I put an electron on the quinone, this glutamic acid becomes more negative, okay? So we have, an, we have these two become, Okay, so th when this is negative, these two become less negative, and then this becomes more negative. See how the protons move in, perhaps from this group and this group, when to these two residues, when you um, reduce the quinone. And that's the kind of thing that you cannot get from average protonation states. You have to know what the exact protonation state is with you know, for each microstate to be see the correlations. So, you know, to, to put, bring that home, there are lots of protonation microstates. Uh, the distribution will see shifts when we do reactions, when we change the pH. Uh, there are often many tautomers with the same ch net charge with different distributions. And also, I, I actually found it pretty interesting that there can be a wide range of charge states. So for re the reaction centers, we saw charge states from minus two to plus six in the ensemble. Okay. So, um, and so now I'm going to really talk, show you about how these proton, are uh, these Knowing this is going to help us to um, find the proton transfer path. Um, I guess first I'm going to tell you how it finds the proton loading sites. And then, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project on cytochrome oxidase. And if I, hopefully I'll have time, another one on uh, complex one. So if we think about how do we move protons across the, um, through the protein across the membrane to bring protons from the low concentration side to the high concentration side. So what we need to do is we need to pull a proton in, we need a proton transfer pathway to move the proton in from the low concentration side. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna close this gate somehow, open the gate to the, to the high concentration side and allow the proton to leave. So this, these are uh, basically requiring uh, transfer pathways and also gates so that we can make sure that the proton comes in from the low concentration side and then re is released to the high concentration side so that when I want to bind a proton inside, I'm only connected to this side. When I want to release the proton, I'm only connected to this side. So what happens is in the middle is that in this, there, there are two, con, two conformations of the protein here, which have radically different proton affinities. One of them has a very high proton affinity, so it can bind a proton from, from the low concentration side. And then you, you make a change in the proton affinity in some way. And at that point, the proton wants to leave. So that's the, you need these, these pathways and you need changes in proton affinity. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is tell you a very little bit about um, cytochrome C oxidase. And again, to show you how the proton loading sites might work when you have multiple charge groups that are involved in, um, in the protonation. 
So here we have um, we we're going to find we're going to find where the protonation microstates are when this region is loaded and unloaded. So there's a region up here that's going to be like this region. It's going to be want to be loaded, find the proton, and then unloaded, release the proton. Okay. So and this is going to have the whole cycle for this protein has four electrons and four protons in order to take um, oxygen and, and make water and release the energy. So let me walk you through this. So we start out, this is the, the important part of the oxidase for, our, for today. And there's a group of amino acid residues and heme propionic acids up here, which, are, which we think bind the proton. Now there's a, a heme here, and we're gonna start with an electron on that heme. There's another heme here, and this is where the chemistry get do gets done, and we'll see what happens. So this is the, uh, the protonation state of this cluster of amino acids up here. So it's got a net charge of minus four. And you, you can trust me, there's a lot of positive groups around it that are not going to be changing their charge that are going to support this minus four um, charge state. All right, so now I'm going to move the proton over to this from heme A to heme A3. I didn't tell the protons what to do. The protons bound in this region and didn't bind 100%, about six tenths, on average, six tenths of a proton bound in this region. Now, if I bring a proton into this, I add it to the water that's bound, the oxygen that's bound here on its way to make water, I find that I lose the proton, okay? So, and so just by moving an electron here, I do that. By moving a proton here, I do that. And I can do that for the other redox states, which I'm not gonna go through. So what happens is, what does this mean? It means that when I have the proton bound, the pK of the proton is high enough. When I have the proton released, the pK of the proton is low enough, all right? So we have a shift in the proton affinity, but what you see is if this is the pH of the, of the medium, all right, the proton affinity goes from above the pH to below the pH. In the same so this is one molecular dynamic snapshot, all right, that we did with QC and and um, and several other and Sung Young uh, Kim from his lab. And so basically, we see there's another snapshot where nothing it just holds on to the proton for dear life. Doesn't matter what I do. And here's another snapshot where the proton basically never binds. So what's the difference here? So what happens when the proton is always loaded, when I do all this up and down, I move the electron, I move the proton, the proton affinity of those groups still changes, but the proton affinity is so high, it's so far above the pH, it never loses the proton, okay? So this, is, this moves up and down, but that's not enough to have the proton release. And likewise, when the proton never binds, again, these are still um, changing when we do the chemistry, but we don't see, it's basically the proton affinity is too low. So in order to have the protons bind and release, you need two things. You need to have a big enough change in proton affinity, but the proton affinity needs to be poised so that the high proton affinity is on one side of the pH and the low proton affinity is on the other side of the pH. So what we what Zhao Hong found in this study is that in fact the, there are um, two kinds so basically when you have the group that never wants to bind a proton it turned out it was in a microstate where the propionic acid had the proton the groups that went up and down that were willing to go up and down they had their their proton on this is so these are two tautomers of the same proton loading site which again 
You can't do if you only have a single residue involved with proton loading unloading, you have a group of residues. And so here, that change, the, the structural changes that mean that this wants to be on the ASP versus this wants to be on the propionate means that this is dynamic and this is fixed. If we look at the ones when this binds a proton, it binds it to the propionic acid, and this can go back and forth. But if you move the proton over to this histidine, you trap it. So again, two tautomers, same charge, very different properties. So there's really three different properties of this system. One where you have a fixed bound, you know, unloaded, a dynamic, loaded, unloaded, that can be modulated by what's going on in the active site, and this one here, which is fixed. I think that this makes sense because you need to have um, situations where you are dynamic, where you can move. But the fact is these are not, these don't hold the proton very tightly. So what you need to do is move it into a, a holding state, which has a much higher affinity for the proton to, to trap it, protonate it. Again, if you want to trap it unprotonated, this state is pretty weakly trapped. This state is more deeply trapped. And so you can basically go back to here, do your changes, and then have these states which are highly stable in one charge state or another. And what Xiaohang found, when you look at this, there's actually a pinching of this um, up here. Never makes a hydrogen bond, never gets that close, but when this group here is more open, the proton basically wants to be unloaded. In the middle region, you go from loaded to unloaded. And when these are close together up here, you trap it. So this is a place where you see that the proton loading, knowing the, the exact microstates, knowing exactly where the proton is, allows you to see where, um, you know, what's going on in, in a new way. So. Um, Okay, so we have dynamic states, we have trap states, and this is only possible with, with multiple residues that are making a complex proton loading site. There are other cases some of you may know about, say glutamic acid 286 and cytochrome oxidase, which is a single residue proton loading site. It's either bound or not bound, and it has different properties. All right, so what I want to do now, how am I doing for time, Walter? Uh, okay, all right. So what I want to do now is talk about, okay, we talked a little bit about the proton loading site. How do we move the proton through the, the system? So here we're going to use um, MCCE. And again, we're going to use the microstate information because what we want to do is to know, is this serine have its proton in a position to make a hydrogen bond to this water, all right? And does this water at the same time, is it in a position to make a hydrogen bond to the next water, the next water? So again, you have to know what's going on in, in the whole state so that you can see whether things are, are hydrogen bonded, okay? And so with Abi, who's here today, we looked at um, complex one, which is a bear, a huge, it's a huge uh, system. And there are three, what are called ant linear anti-porter um, sites, channels, and one much more complicated. And, and we'll, you know, I think it's unclear right now whether it's being used, but this is what we've spent our time on. This is called the E-channel. So there are three of these anti-porter channels and one E-channel, and that four protons are pumped for four, for um, two electrons going on to the quinone. Okay, so we're gonna look at this region here. Okay, and we're gonna look at the protonation, how things can transfer through, okay. And what you see is a really complicated potential proton transfer pathway. So this is on the P side, which is the top of what I was showing. This is on the N side. This is, I'm sorry, this is on the P side, which is at the bottom. This is the protons come in from this side. And so these circles are from a network analysis and every residue. So each one of these residues, each one of these nodes is a, an amino acid residue. 
they are connected to each other either directly or by one, two, three, or four waters. And everybody in, and so we're looking at multiple microstates in the Monte Carlo sampling here. And basically each of these in the circle have, I don't know, 10 or more connect or connected to to I think 10 or more of the other residues in the circle. So the, my, my working hypothesis is that everybody in that circle essentially shares the proton and it will go to where it is uh, at lowest energy. And then there's connections between the circles and you, know, and you see it's extremely complicated, lots of ways to move protons. Uh, there is a break, there's a break. There's a break right here, which is pretty hard to get a proton through, which I think is what Leo Sazanov thinks that this is not going to transfer protons, but I'm still not sure. And one thing we did was we looked at what happens when you run trajectories in different re reaction states. And so I just want to point out that you can see down here, there are fewer connections here than here. All right, here, there are lots of connections here, not as many connections on this side. Here, there are fewer connections here, more on this side. So when we look at a trajectory, we will see that the connectivity changes, suggesting perhaps that the proton is bound, perhaps here, and then released here. So what I wanna do is look at the proton loading behavior in this region here, which is this central cluster, which basically is in the center of the protein. It's this purple region here. And um, it, it basically is a long thing. This is over 20 angstroms from one end to the other. Okay, so it's quite long. And so what we're going to do is basically take um, this group of residues and look at the protonation states of this group of residues. And I want to point out, Avi's group did molecular dynamics on this. Um, we do MCCE on this, okay? We don't do it on the whole protein. And so we want to see where the charges are. So this is the group of residues in this site which change charge, okay? And what we find, I guess what I want to say is we find in the whole protein, there are 243 protonation states, three protonatable residues with over like 50 to 60,000 protonation microstates. Um, to get 90% of the whole ensemble, you need you know, tens of thousands. If we look just at this small region, we see that instead there, we have 25 residues that are protonatable. 10 minutes, thank you. We have you know, now a much more reasonable number of protonation states, and we can actually get 90% uh, with, again, a, a much smaller number. So this is more tractable. So, we, we, so um, Raihan, who's working on this now, basically, isolated snapshots that had that were tended to be loaded, um, which is here. Okay, so this has a charge of minus 1.11. And you can see there are say several microstates up here that are loaded. And then this is the microstate, the highest, the, the lowest energy microstate that's unloaded that has a charge of minus two. He found microstates snapshots that were mostly essentially 50% um, loaded, 50% unloaded. So you, again, you see here are the two highest ones and then ones that are mostly unloaded. And again, you can see here this is. So what we looked at is what is the protonation behavior in active microstates in the unloaded state? And we see these are um, acids or red, bases are blue and the, these are uh, neutral. Okay, so what we see is that in the unloaded state, the proton, so we wanna get the proton down at this end and that's this end. So in the unloaded states, the proton is not at this end, but when we look at the loaded states where we've added a proton, what's nice is the proton tends to add towards the end side. So it tends to move down to here. Where, so these are the, the protonation states in the loaded case. Um, 
we can again look at the, um, the correlation. And what we see here is that this uh, GLU-163 is strongly correlated with 72. It's strongly correlated with 130. It's strongly correlated with um, 251. So it's kind of at the center, all right? So this guy's in the center. There's weak correlations here, okay? So that's what you see from the heat map is where who's talking to each other. Okay, and you see this is for the, the half loaded and you see the correlations are different when you're in the unloaded and loaded structures, which I'm not gonna go into. So the thing that we kind of found, which was interesting is what's the, when we found these complex um, networks, we found them in cytochrome oxidase, we found them in complex one, and then we said, how conserved are they? And it turns out they're less conserved than you think. And so let's just look at the, one of the anti-porter. So this is the, these are very, okay. So this is the anti-porter comes in, it goes here. And these are a hundred percent conserved. Okay? These are really highly conserved. Why did that do that? Um, but if I look at the, um, if I look at what we've done now is we've taken a residue that's centered on one of our residues of interest and looked at the volume of space around the residues of interest. So this is the, the resid this is the, in the volume of space around these residues, which are in our, um, this is our ASP72 and GLU74 that were uh, here. Okay, so we're gonna look at, make a volume of space around this, and then look at what happens to the residues in that volume. And you can see that not, you know, this is the, the two residues that we put in, they're pretty conserved, but the rest of it's not so much. If we look at um, one third, so if we look at um, one six, if we look at, uh, 163, which was at the center of the network, which was strongly correlated with others, then this was highly conserved. But the other ones that we found in our heat map were much less highly conserved. All right, so that's this guy here, not very well conserved. This histidine, not very well conserved. This glutamic acid, not very well conserved. So if we look at that, we see this is well conserved, these are well conserved, but these, which are in, in for this particular organism, are connected, are not very well conserved. Okay, so uh, how much time do I have? Uh, five. I still have five? Okay, all right, so I'm gonna ask the question, um, if I have all these complicated networks, what do I, I mean, that's like crazy. I mean, I can't, you know, how, where does the pro, can I, can I give you more information about how the proton transfers? I mean, like, okay, I start out here somewhere. I mean, how do I have any idea of knowing like which one of these is gonna move the proton? So we worked out a method that we have not applied to complex one, but we've applied to other systems, which is, which was benchmarked on gramicidin. So gramicidin is this weird helix. I would tell you if any of you are simulators, never work on gramicidin. It's the worst thing in the world. Um, and what happens here is that the, the waters are like an icing glass and they flip very occasionally between one side and the other. This is in molecular dynamics. And so they might be pointing in this direction or they might be pointing in that direction and they're rarely pointing in, in the middle, okay? So what we, what Ying Ying Zhang did is we wanted to see what, this is a, 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 a high, this is a proton transfer channel. And we wanted to see, okay, what's the barrier for proton transfer through this? And that is known, um, there's a, we know what the, the rate of proton transfer is through gramicidin. So from that, you can get a, estimate the barrier. So what we did, again, we're not doing anything too fancy, is, is we take the each water and we make it a hydronium and we let the system relax in, in MCCE. So again, it's not, the backbone's not moving, things are, are still, you know, we let the hydrogen bonds relax. And then we move it down to the next one. And we at each point, we calculate the total system energy of the ensemble. All right, so we can know if we put the, 
I draw them in one place or another, what the, um, what the energy is. And so what we got was we basically got this nice um, energy of transferring the hydronium across. And this agrees with other people's um, with EVB. It agrees with experiment reasonably well, I think within a kilocalorie or so. So I was for, for such a simple classical model. I would have, I've been pretty happy with this. So D um, Divya Kerr had a very complicated proton transfer pathway. And this is I keep switching proteins on you, but I'm sorry, is photosystem two. And what she did was she put a pro, uh, the hydronium on every single uh, water in the system and she found the energy and she found that certain regions were more favorable, which would be going out this way. And other regions were more unfavorable, which would be going out this way. So even though we wouldn't have known that this was more favorable than this, just by looking at it, um, we could basically by looking at the, um, the hydronium energy along each, each water, um, we could basically make a prediction that this is the active channel where hydronium is happier and this is less active. And so this is, again, you can get the energies that you're getting along this and one of the channels is more happy, middle, bad. Okay, so um, that's all I'm going to tell you, probably too much. Um, we, we have linear versus complicated pathways, networks. Um, you know, we have um, these paths. And actually, let me just take the time to get, tell you who did it. So Chang Sui and his Chang Yung Sun it, and Puja World helped us with the cytochrome oxidase. Uh, Avi Singh Ra and Chitrat Gupta helped us doing the molecular dynamics on complex one. Uh, Raihan's working on complex one. Um, these guys are doing other things. Um, and these are lab alums where they are. Junjun Mao has been really helping me forever. He was a, my first postdoc and he is still working on coding up MCCE. Okay. Uh, the hydroxyl, hydronium, yeah, so the hydronium do fit in there, so it's, there's, there's enough room for the hydronium, yeah, inside the gramocidin, we didn't, So we, we basically, what we do here is that each water has a lot of conformation. So in the, in the Monte Carlo sampling, so protons can be in all different directions. So we basically give it another object that has three protons instead of two. So there's a, there can be a competition between hydronium and water. But for this, we basically say, you must be hydronium. The waters around you can rearrange. So we basically put it on a, you know, we're kind of putting it on a stick and moving it one, and then we then we say the second water, you must be a hydronium. And then we say the third water, you must be a hydronium. So we don't, I, I don't think we didn't, we had many problems with this. This is really this is really like an Ising model. It just everybody has to shift at the same time, but so it's hard to converge, but but you don't have problems with with fitting it. Miguel. Hi, Marilyn. So I have a question and a small provocation. <laughs> I'm going to start with the provoking you. So in, in your models, you used arginines. You always include arginines to try to find the pathways because they have a role. But did you ever observe uh, the protonation? Actually, we don't we, we don't treat arginines as as, as growth is competent residues. So we, we took them out. 
because not only do they have that super high PK, but the other thing is if you take a proton off one of the nitrogens, you actually have to put it back on the same nitrogen and it's really hard to go any distance. So we, we view um, arginines, asparagine, glutamines as what we call fences. They, they basically set the electrostatic environment around it. They can help make the hydrogen bond orientation, but we don't think our arginines are, are good for Grotus. 13 years ago, you asked me, if we, if we consider arginines, shouldn't we consider a carbonyl from the main chain? Do you remember that? <laughs> you were discussing that 13 I, years it ago. Sounds like something <laughs> I would say, yes. So my question now has to do with the, with the proton um, networks. When you when you build those networks, you use different snapshots from MD uh, originally. Um, do you think these networks are robust enough to the bias of the protonation states using the MD? Did this you try different protonation states to see if the networks hold? This is just a curiosity. Uh, yeah. I don't think you could you you could do it differently. We, we actually have a paper you, doing this with bacterial reaction centers that, that we looked at, at the, how the networks change. You know, it's it's actually was less bad than I thought it would be. I, re I really thought it would be terrible. Um, but it may also be that different proteins are different. I mean, we're really trying to talk Abi into redoing, into continuing Abi, wherever you are, uh, and into continuing um, with defined protonation states that we're seeing in, in these clusters and seeing if if that works. I mean, one thing is we really want to open up a channel between these different clusters where this is a hydrophobic region. And we think what we do see in say cytochrome oxidase, if you get the, the charges right, you open a cavity. You know, if your charges are wrong, you don't. So it's it's each each one is different. But we are looking at that. And I think it's you know un, it's really bad. Hey, hey, Marilyn. Yeah, uh, I have the microphone. So, <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, gramocytin is is uh, difficult to work with computationally. It's a fun molecule to play with experimentally, oh, <laughs> um, because you know it's relatively short, and you can do fun things like changing the chirality of the amino acids and actually change that alpha helix, and then measure um, how well it continues to function. And I've been sitting through all this, just wondering how you can verify any of this with experimental data, and that might be something to compare to. Oh, so to, to look at the, um, yeah, I mean, one could look at the barrier for protons going through if you had different gramocytons with different, um, you know, that have been mutated. One of the things that I'm actually looking for, anybody interested, I actually think that it, these protonation microstates are, my, are, are, a, underlying uh, spectral inhomogeneity. So if anybody's calculating spectra and you would like to see a distribution of protonation and, and side chain polar, pro, polar group um, distributions, and you can calculate your, your spectral with that way instead of just loading it on you know, 200 reciprocal centimeters. Um, so that's something because it's because these are equilibrium properties to see, actually see it you need to you know have a, an instantaneous snapshot which you get in the spectrum it might be worth just looking at the literature to see what has been measured already to maybe guide some maybe. or maybe just never want to see it again i don't know <laughs> well I, I think we need somebody to do the calculation with our conformational and protonation substates and see if that gives you you know, 200 reciprocal centimeters. Uh, hello. Uh, in the cytochrome C oxidase example, when you were talking about the trapped states, um, did you find that they shift between the trapped and dynamic states um, naturally? Eventually they shift, or are they thermodynamically trapped in one or another? You know, we don't, this is something I don't know. This, this is actually something I would really like to do with constant PHMD. Because we know, you know, here's a case where I, I, I know I have six residues that are, that are important. And I know that I can trigger 
you know, the, the folding, the, the, the proton binding by putting an electron on the nearby heme. So I think that this is a case where I probably could converge the constant pHMD because I can fix everything around it and really just look at um, the residues of interest doing the same things we did in MCCE and see what the barrier is. So that's something we do see in trajectories made in different states that they do prefer to be in dynamic or, or fixed loaded or fixed unloaded states. Just as a, as a, as a bit of curiosity, the, um, the, all the crystal structures are fixed, um, fixed loaded. They're just absolutely, they've got a proton bound. They don't ever get, give it away. Great, thank you. I, uh, I have a question, actually. Oh, okay. So, how computationally costly is to build one of those networks? Yeah, I mean, not maybe an hour, or two, you know, an hour or two. It's not you have you well. Once you've got the, you have to get the the MCCE. So that, depending on what you're doing, might take you a day or two. Um, and then once you've got that, you then have a hydrogen bond lookup table, and you go through your microstates. So, so one of the things we managed to do in Junjun with Junjun's help is to have a very efficient way to store the 25 million microstates, so that we can then, you know, mine them to do what we need to do. So it's not it's not a week; it's probably a day or two or less. Okay. We had okay. a, a question from uh, our online uh, uh, attendees. I think Michael Lund ah. uh, wanted to hey, make Michael. a question. He, Right. We should yeah. hear. Hi, I'm Aaron. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can uh, you hear that? Yeah. All right. I, I, I just had a, a maybe a slightly technical question. So, so I'm wondering when you do the Monte Carlo sampling, um, like like any sampling, you, how do you check convergence that you actually sample sample all the states because I, I imagine that I mean, you showed some energy diagram I, I wonder if you could get trapped and, and end up in some local minima and you, that are some states that you're not sampling at all is that is that an issue or, or something that you you have to worry about when doing these simulations yeah so I would say for grandma side we really would get trapped that would that was really something that that we found happened a lot for um for other things we we basically have, you know, we basically run multiple times and we see, you know, essentially the same, the, the high probability microstates we see over and over. Those don't change. The ones at the bottom where you only have, you see 10 or 12 times, those are going to change. So, so basically, um, you know, if you rerun the Monte Carlo, the, the convergence is very good. I don't know. I mean, that other than trying it multiple times, I, do you have a better way to check convergence? You probably oh, do. No, I mean, um, it's something that I worry about sometimes, but I have, I, I cannot give any good solution. I wonder yeah. if you have something in mind, but. Uh, right. I, I think we basically I, just, ch you know, check that everything's reproducible. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes thinking about, uh, and when we've done that, uh, tried, you know, some replica exchange, for example, where you, you you go over pH, for example, that could be one way to to do it, I think. But uh, uh, but but maybe it's not an issue. I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering. That's I could imagine that in some cases this could be this could show up, and you could get trapped if you have a lot of states, uh, and, you, and somehow you end up in in one particular state. But uh, it's it's to be honest, I don't think it's having a lot of states. I think it's having a lot of correlated states. So say I'm going to come back to our poor grandma side, and we only have seven waters, but they all have to move in together. I mean, it's a really, you know, they just to get, you know, they're, they're so, so correlated. Generally hmm. inside of the protein, the states are not that correlated. So I can make a move. And even if it's a little unhappy, it's not so bad. So we, what we see is when we have strong correlation, as you say, when you we do a pH titration, one will be up and the next will be, you can see that they, they go up and down as a function of pH rather than going smoothly. And then we know like some groups are really correlated and we're really stuck. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.